Fantastic. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Nerdist Book Club. We're live on Nerdist YouTube and Geek and Sentry's Twitch. I'm Actor Navarro, and joining me as always are Mod Garrett and Rachel Hine. Hi. Here's the thing. I have to whisper right now <laughs> for maybe another minute or two. <laughs> you want me to I'm sh- What you want to yeah, do? Wanna- can- yeah, I'll step yes. in. Yeah, yeah. Step in for the intro. Oh, I mean, I'd, back. I'd like the I'd like the tone and the vibe of this, though. I really like welcome. It. very intimate. Welcome, welcome. I, I would just love to explain why, super quick, I'm sharing my garage with my girlfriend, who is also working and was supposed to be done at five and has gone a little over in a professional voice actor capacity. So I have to share. <laughs> Please take over, Mod. Thank you so much, everybody. Hello, and welcome to Nerdist Book Club, everyone. We are live on Nerdist's YouTube and on Geek and Sundry's Twitch. I am Hector Navarro. No, I'm Maud Garrett. Joining me as always, we've got Rachel Hine and Hector. Hello, hello. Thank you for all of you guys for joining us as well, whether you're in the United States or not. Uh, this week slash month slash year has been pretty, pretty stressful. Let's Let's not lie or dance around it so we are happy uh, to be with you just for a little bit and thank you for the distraction as well because this is a very necessary thing to just not think about all the bad things just for a bit if this is your first time hi there welcome to notice book club it's our online book club where we break down new and favorite books in genres like horror in this case gothic romance ish horror fantasy science fiction preferably with a beverage. Hector, you got your beer. Rach, you got your rosé. Maud, you got your insulated bottle of water. I have to I have to wait until I open it because it might make too much noise, but so. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, this month we're reading Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Uh, Hector, have you got me with, you probably do. Yeah, really I, good not... job on the pronunciation, Maud, really good. Thank you. I'm trying a lot better. Like, I want to be super respectful, but like, my gosh, if I may, like my dialect with that kind of stuff, not, not great, not fantastic. Um, let, huh, I'm just switching my stream around so I can see you. I'm glad that you were showing off the book. Yeah. Beautiful. Hard cover and all. Yeah. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really enjoying it so far. What do you, uh, we were just looking at the published date as well. For this mm-hmm. book, it came out this year, and it's also already optioned to be a limited series on Hulu, which is exciting. Cool. Um, yeah, and I, I, I know that we shared um, the playlist that Sylvia Moreno Garcia um, shared with her Twitter audience. And are you free, Hector? I can't tell. Um, so we're if good, you baby, are- we're good. We're good. Yay, he's yeah. back. <laughs> on track for this week honestly but yeah um that's that's already been optioned and uh one of the lovely writers of nerdist rosie knight loved this book um and was really excited that we picked it and i'm super digging it so far hector do you want to tell us a little bit about azelfa i would love to (laughs) i would love to full voice to tell you about the author (laughs) like mod said a second ago and pronounced her name beautifully. Silvia Moreno Garcia is, quote, Mexican by birth, Canadian by inclination. You know what, Silvia? I think a lot of us can feel that inclination, whether we've ever visited Canada or not. According to her official bio, she's also written the novels Signal to Noise, Certain Dark Things about narco vampires in Mexico City. Hello. I'm gonna I know. I had to include that because I was like, what? Um, that sounds so good. <laughs> Gods of Shade and Shadow and Mexican Gothic, which like Maud said, is currently being adapted for a limited series on Hulu. Moreno Garcia has also edited several anthologies, won multiple genre awards for her work and wrote her master's thesis on quote, women and eugenic thought in the world of H.P. Lovecraft. Very appropriate. Very Yes, cool. I know, I know. And we picked this book um, from suggestions from all of y'all. So thank you for that. I know that we had talked about this book as well we, we've been wanting to read it and I have to say I'm just very excited to be uh reading so much spooky stuff that's not like too spooky where Maude doesn't like it and yeah. I also before we get into this 
book. I just want to brag about books that smell really good that I just ordered on eBay and they finally came. Um, so if you read Goosebumps, you know, R.L. Stein. R.L. Stein also did kind of tier, tier, teen murder books from Fear Street, um, which is being adapted into, I think, a movie and then a show. But all, then it would lead you in the library to Christopher Pike. And Mike Flanagan, who just did The Haunting of Hill House and Haunting of Bly Manor, is adapting one of his books, The Midnight Club. But between that, I wanted to order them. And then there's been a couple of me like Twitter memes going around of you know books that kind of influenced you a lot when you were a kid. And between obviously all of these, I have like 15, um, but like Lois Duncan and all of these, like Carolyn B. Cooney, I was like, wow, I really was, I've just been in thrillers and spooky stuff since, but I just had to show some of the covers because so good. There's skeletons in there. The starlight crystal. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> so let us know in the comments if you ever read any of these because I'm excited to read all See of them later. again. Was that and they smell so later? good. They're like yellowed. Yeah. That's amazing. Anyway. That's my brag. That's my book brag um, of the day. There are some great comments in the chat. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Kelsey Clary earlier said ASMR book club. No. Uh, Steven Summer says, I like to whisper to. Uh, Miss Necromancer says, no talking during dinner. Did not mean to do that. Um, uh, Shot Putt Blue 23 says, thank you for recommending that playlist sector that music was Chef's Kiss. Yes, the author, Sylvia Moreno Garcia, she has a playlist on Spotify, which was super dope. Um, the Tamaranian says, make sure you tag the VOD version of this episode with hashtag ASMR to draw on some new <laughs> viewers. Um, this is great. Uh, NYXWing38 says, I've been reminding myself about book club over and over to get myself through this day. Me too. Uh, GameWizard001, anyone else get Fall of the House of Usher from Mexican Gothic? Well, I would love to pass it over to Maud for a second. Mm. If you would be so kind, Maud, to... Tell us what is gothic horror before we jump into our thoughts and then we jump into the chapter by chapter breakdown. I would love for you to let everybody know. I would love to because I am learning so much about this genre because it is one that I have barely sort of tapped into, even though I feel like Rachel is like an expert. Like she's got, <laughs> she's hit her 10,000 hours, you know, on, <laughs> on the genre. Uh, but it's been really fun for me to learn a little bit about it. It was first popularized in the 1700s as part of the dark romanticism movement. Again, screams Rachel. Uh, classic Gothic horror novels include a previously um, polled book that we suggested, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, Dracula by Bram Stoker, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Had to do that in high school. Yeah. All we did was just watch Kate Bush's Heathcliff. Oh, oh great. Because she's talking about this book that you're reading. And I was like, oh, you're trying to make me care. I love that you're trying. Um, the turn of the screw, which is going to be, isn't that, that what Bly Manor That's is? That's one of the stories um, that Bly, Bly Manor is based on a couple of Henry James ghost stories, mm -hmm. but that's the main one. Rebecca by Daphne de M M Muria. Moria. Mo 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 I can't. Moria, which is, Rebecca is now on Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't watched it yet. Well, it's getting pretty average reviews and the timing of it was not amazing because Lily James was having an affair with the lead actor from The Affair. Oh, we love irony. Uh, the tr uh, anything by- mean the, the married guy who was having an affair? But he's, he's from the show. Oh, the I know. Affair. Oh yeah. And he's going to play uh, Prince Philip. Just going to- Oh, right. Okay. There you go. Uh, the Haunting of- Hill House by Shirley Jackson, which was our very first book for Alpha Book Club, uh, and pretty much anything Edgar Allan Poe, which I have never delved into. Yeah, hmm. the closest, I, closest I've come is that classic Simpsons segment from the first Treehouse of Horror Halloween Simpsons special, uh, The Raven, where it's just Bart as the Raven. Instead of saying, quote, the Raven nevermore, it's, it's quote, the Raven, eat my shorts. And yeah, Homer is it's Edgar Bart. Allen. It's Homer, Bart. It, Bart. Yeah, is the narrator like, Oh, are you Raven? It's pretty great. Um, who does Dorian Gray? Uh, that's oh, oh, it's gonna bother me so much. I got it. I gotcha. Oh, if only we had some kind of computing device. I know, but Oscar I want to remember it. Oh, Oscar, Oscar, Wilde. Oscar Wilde. Is that yes. was, does that, that fall under? Because I Oscar mom bought me that book forever and a day ago. You think I read it? Uh, it's somewhere. It's good, here. and that's a that's <laughs> another one for sure. 
-hmm. we got to do that. Thank you, Miss Necromancer. Kate, 10 points to uh, Ravenclaw. Uh, tropes of Gothic horror. These are the tropes that you can find in the books. We've got the crumbling, abandoned, decaying settings, like a castle or a labyrinth or a haunted house. There's the atmosphere uh, of mystery and suspense, nightmares, omens and visions, supernatural or seemingly supernatural events or creatures like vampires, werewolves and ghosts, damsels in distress. The complex anti-heroes with hidden secrets and then the dark, impossible romance. So far, this book is checking that entire list except for maybe one thing, maybe. As what would to, yours, what, what would you say? I would say so far, we haven't hit supernatural, but we have hit seemingly this goes, super, Right, but it's like, we haven't seen it yet. We've, we have seen the nightmares, omens, and visions though, and that mm -hmm. might fall into the same... Um, so thank you for that breakdown mod. Lee was also telling me through our chat, Hector, plug your Simpsons watch along. Sure. Yes, if you like the Simpsons, I watch it every Sunday night. I watch six episodes and you can follow along on Disney plus and it's fun. Before we get, get into the breakdown of it, I would like to go around and get everybody's overall thoughts. I, I'll start. I really enjoyed it. And I'm not mad that we went from like spooky book to spooky book to spooky. Like, I'm like, they, they each have such a different, and I'm counting Lovecraft going right into um yep. uh the the haunting of ashburn house going well, we've, right we've into... kind of gone from like a, a supernatural horror but like yeah. lovecraftian is almost its own sort of subgenre in itself uh, yeah it's like cosmic sci-fi sci-fi horror yeah. yeah um you know with definite sort of historical vibes and mm -hmm learning lessons there mm -hmm. to another sort of gothic horror but a modern sense like so it's not sort of like in an in an in a special era or location mm -hmm. um which i guys i liked it i liked yeah. the book yeah. and i'm watching kind of more horror-esque like i'm i'm wading the waters mm -hmm. into horror mm -hmm. that's and great i think i'm gonna watch crimson Crim crimson peak Ooh, i you know think we'll love Crimson Peak, you know, um, is, I think, much more of a gothic romance than any sort of horror. Um, and it's so be it's so gorgeous. Yeah. And there are a lot of, you know, movies and shows like that that are sort of marketed or billed as horror that aren't really that scary. And they're much more, mm -hmm. like, moody. And again, like, the dark romance, the crumbling castle, like, this whole, it's, like, such a vibe instead of, like, boom, I got you, you know? And so yeah. that's... And I love the dramatics of that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's so, like, it, yes. And I, I also, what I really like about this so far is that it does hit all of the tropes, but it also is um, subverting quite a few of them. Um, a, just by, you know, the location um just giving a different historical context and learn you know relearning or learning about depending on who you are um you know the, the mexican uh uh revolution and independence from spain and a lot of the sort of politics and horrible uh events of that time period mm -hmm. and in our lead character i think you know her cousin is kind of a damsel in distress, but I love that the, you know, in in so many gothic horror or romances, there's this like, oh, this poor girl, and she fell for the bad guy who's also the good guy, and he's complicated, and you know, blame a lot of my dating choices on that uh, archetype. In my twenties, in my twenties, um, not anymore, um, <laughs> so far, um, but. Uh, I, I like that she is such a force of nature and not complying with the vibes and like sort of what you expect from a lead character in a gothic horror story yeah. so far. Yeah, she's not weeping. Whoa. <laughs> Hector. Did that work? With your hair. It a did. A it did bit. for me. Um, my first impressions of this book, I am loving it. Like uh, I'm the cartographer mentioned, like I am breezing through this book. Mm -hmm. I It's about a two and a half hour listen. I'm loving the narrator. It's done in almost like, you know how, uh, is it? Sh 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 oh, 
Clueless is kind of based on Emma, isn't it? Mm-hmm. In like some sort of weird mm-hmm. story. Yeah. Where- I'm kind of getting very, because she's a socialite who has a great wardrobe and she loves to play piano because, you know, it's a it's a cool social skill to have. Uh, how she's like a little bit flippant about her direction in life. Uh, I'm kind of getting a little bit of Cher vibes from that, but in a sort of like, Mexican 1950s version Mm -hmm. and I love the soap opera vibe of it all like the dramatics of it you must go and rescue your your cousin she's not well okay father that's that's the gothic exactly I love that I'm eating it up completely so I agree that the the listen is fantastic um but and I think it was uh, Nix who just kind of touched upon it in the, yeah, Nix Wing um, 38. The whole mushroom fungi thing has me very interested. And I wonder mm. if maybe there are spores that the ghosts are releasing to cause nightmares and misfortune. Mm. So I'm getting like 1950s Mexican clueless vibes mixed in with annihilation. Yes. Oh, I put yeah. that in the spores. <laughs> I put wow. that in the notes when Golden we got to her flexing. nightmare part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah guys this book is sick <laughs> yeah it's yeah. really fun and i i totally agree with you that she's this oh, tell a novella. who like tell a novella. uh tell yeah novella. and oh yeah like jane the virgin oh, so good um or destinos which i watched a lot of as a kid um and <laughs> which is so good uh but um she's she is kind of flighty in a socialite but she's all, she also wants to go get her master's in anthropology and is actually really smart. Yeah. And especially given the time period, you know, she is frequently sort of in her um, uh, inner monologue, just reflecting on because she's from high society, she knows that women have to be nice or they're a bitch when men can do all of these things, or she knows how to hold her own without pissing them off too much where there's just enough um, you know, feigned innocence or, or something like that. Um, so I like that she is smart, but also is like, yeah, I like going to parties. I like the freedom of driving in a convertible movie star hair. I appreciate the way that I look, which directly I think dovetails into some of the more nefarious elements of the family she's staying with. Um, but yeah, I really love her. I love, uh, yeah. Noemi. I think she's so cool. Noemi. Yeah. Abuela. How do we in the uh, audiobook mod? Because I'm trying to uh, 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 observe the accent in Noemi. And so is it Noemi? Noemi? No, Noemi? Noemi? Tabuela. Tabuela. Yeah. Noemi oh. Tabuela. Noemi Tabuela. Yeah, love it. Um, I My overall thoughts, like I was saying earlier, and I agree with this comment, Weirwood, I'm loving the book. It's nothing like what I'd normally read. I feel the same. I wouldn't normally read uh, uh, this genre, but I'm really intrigued by the setting. I am invested in the somewhat oh. oppressive feeling, but also a kind of a hopeful feeling. It's, it is 1950. It is like, you know, World War II had ended and, and th- this family sort of like well off. And it's like, oh, there's a lot of possibility and potential and they seem like the father, Noemi's father is not um, progressive by any means, but he's still like, I want you by yourself to go and, you know, which I'm like, that's pretty cool. It's just, it's a very interesting setting and I'm super into it. And I think that the the house is giving me Overlook Hotel vibes from The Shining for sure. Which we're um, both and then done. In mm-hmm. this recent chapter, when, when she went down to like the village and found like the healer woman and every, the way that, that uh, uh, Sylvia Moreno Garcia was describing everything with like, here's what's in her house and the different candles and everything. I was recalling my knowledge and my upbringing of like, yeah, this feels like places I would visit in Mexico with my family. This feels oh, cool. like it's, it's relatives, houses or cousins houses or whatever. So like that was super familiar to me. And then we would, you know, we're gonna presumably go back up to the spooky house. And that feels very much like cinematic and like Crimson Peak and like, the shining and all this other stuff in fact i was at first listening to the crimson peak soundtrack while reading but then i remembered about the spotify playlist and went to that and it fit really well mod i looked it up crimson peak on hulu there we go listen it's a bunch oh so good you're gonna you're gonna well i don't know if you're gonna love it but a bunch of people were saying uh like shy little violet and um uh uh shy little violet said uh where is it let me find it here hang on where is it where did i just crimson peak is the best uh, Tim and Daisy said, yes, Mod, watch Crimson Peak. 
It was beautiful. Um, uh, uh, there's another one. Game Wizard, Crimson Peak is a beautiful film, both story and design. Also, Tim and Daisy earlier said, Rachel, I totally read some of those books, LOL. So there we go. Oh, good. I've, um, um, hold on. <laughs> okay. Okay. What happened? Okay. There we go. We have the drink. We got some books on the ground. Okay. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> what um, it's all good. So overall thoughts are, if you I'm a mess, me, y'all. The election, I just, oh. forgive me. Okay. No problem. Forgiven. You're forgiven. Uh, first six chapters, again, what has really happened? It's a lot of introductory stuff, but it's all oh, really I thought we would... Very soap opery. What is it, Maude? What's going on? I may have listened to chapter seven. Oh, snap. By accident. Mm -hmm. okay. Typical mod. Maybe Typical. not, maybe not. I think I read Typical the first, listen to, the, listen to all of six stopped at seven. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're, that's what we're shooting for. Hi, Ryan. Hello, hi. Good to see you. Um, uh, oh, Ryan! Yep. So yeah, so just to go back, I'm really enjoying it. The spooky nightmare was great, but nothing beyond that has really happened, but I'm thinking about it and I'm like, good. If something crazy supernatural were to happen this early with this type of story, with this character in this setting, I would feel like maybe it would be a little forced. But I, I remember we dealt with some real spooky stuff early on in Ashburn House and it kind of worked. I was like, this is great. And we were able to bounce back from that the first night or whatever. But um, this has been fantastic so far. So should we dive in? Yeah, let's let's do it. And I also think, um, what was I going to say? I, I think because this is more, also, by the way, anyone who missed our chat with Darcy last oh, week, the author so of good. Ashburn House, like Love we're me. obsessed with her. She is the cutest human <laughs> ever. I'll just, let's, re let's recreate it real quick. Uh, Rachel, just give Darcy a compliment. Oh, Darcy, I just loved your books and how you took the gothic genre and really played around with it. Oh, thank you so much. I just so appreciate that. Thank you. I just love to write. It's, I just really do. Thank you. Thank we you. Were, wow. Like, texting. <laughs> Being While like, I was texting. Like, I'm obsessed with her. I want to be her yeah. best friend. Like she yeah. is yeah. so cute and loves writing and loves her cats. And we just want all of the success for her. She's amazing. But I also think in more classic like Wuthering Heights and those things, it is, it's drawn out. The pacing is a little different. I don't feel like it's slow in no. my opinion, this no. part. Some of the like classic classics that were actually written in the 1800s can be a little slow if you're not you know used to that genre. But I do think that it's, if it happens too quickly, and this was also the case in Ashburn House, like there were noises and things but it didn't, things didn't get crazy supernatural until pretty yep. far into the book. Yep. Yeah. So there is this like almost display, like, especially because so many of the, the protagonists in the genre are women, they're kind of trying to talk themselves out of being the hysterical woman. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate too, that all of these men are trying to, you know, paint Noemi as hysteric and, and Catalina as hysterical or agitated or all of these things. She's like, I'm not agitated. Like, and in her head, she's like, they're just worried I'm going to cry because yeah. they think all women do is cry. Just, but I she used her. that, she, so she manipulated that as well, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go ahead and then dive in. Let's break it down chapter by chapter. We've only got six to cover and then we can keep talking about um, how we I, felt about the I book. Checked. And, what's that? You I read? Checked, I, yeah, I stopped okay. at eight. I stopped at eight. Okay, okay, that's fine. You read yeah. chapter seven? That's fine. Yeah. That's good, that's good, that's good. That's okay. <clears throat> we'll just like, do Hector, Hector's the disappointed dad right now. So we'll just well, I'm gonna use tonight. the chat. Um, so uh, the part that we ended at in this is when she's leaving the village. Mm -hmm. she, yeah, she had the icky dream. Well, yeah, she, had, had, she had yes. one one dream oh yeah what are you talking about see I, this always happens this yeah. is that's I, why i wanted to know what no. was it's the last so, chapter so, so i know when to stop so think about the story you know what i can do though can i please give a icky warning for this the first chapter that everyone will read after tonight i actually think that it's worth having like okay. a just a heads up a disclaimer like yeah. warning yeah. okay yeah yeah okay okay which i kind of wish i had but yeah just a little okay. bit of like a uh yeah. Trigger, okay. Trigger warning. Good. Okay. Good, good to know. know. Good to know. Okay. So we're going to jump in chapter one, which is the chapter we all read. We're not going to cover chapter seven. We all read chapter one. Okay. So we start Noemi 
Taboada is a young socialite in 1950, Mexico City. Both of her parents believe a woman's place is to marry well, even though Noemi wants to attend university and date Hugo Duarte or Hugo, whose family is not in the same social standing as hers. And her dad's pissed about it, but it's also kind of like, they're sort of letting her date him still in a way, you know what I mean? Like yeah. and, and she's got a lot of socialite freedom in that sense. She goes to parties and she, and she drives and does all this stuff that feels like she's doing what she wants to. She pushes, yeah, I think she's, she pushes them and because mm -hmm. she doesn't embarrass them necessarily, it's mm -hmm. not like she's saying, I'm gonna marry him. I'm, we're just like courting right. or whatever. It's yeah. almost like he's, he's letting her have a bit of a longer leash. Uh, which is a terrible analogy, but also pretty apt for pretty, fathers yeah. in pretty oppressive good. situations pretty um, pretty, um, pretty or men in oppressive situations. And right. um, I, I also really like that, you know, we get a really good background in the first chapter of kind of mm -hmm. the setup, but then everything starts to kind of peel back as you go and it's mm -hmm. not too exposition she's leaving hmm. from a party she's got like a boyfriend or or or, or guy friend and like he's dressed as a horse and he's got to take the head off and you know he's trying to pay her attention and now she's like i'm not, I'm not gonna pay him attention like that's that's her kind of vibe yeah, she's great so she's talking to her dad <laughs> at night noemi's father suggests that he is concerned for her cousin catalina who is recently married catalina has written a letter claiming that her new husband virgil doyle is poisoning her very british and she is seeing ghosts. That's what's in the letter. Shop the objects vibes? What's that? Shop objects vibes? Ooh. Yes. Yeah, okay. a little bit. And and as you, I think, I won't say anything else, but gothic horror definitely, I'm just, speak for mod specifically, mm. but gothic horror, there is an element of like, is it, is it a ghost or is it something more realistic, but yes. still yes. creepy and nefarious, like Absolutely. Wuthering Heights? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and all or that, that movie, an Amer like or that movie, the American Haunting or something, where it was like based on the based on the only time in American history when a person was killed by a ghost, but it was actually, and I think people believe or Amityville life, Horror and things it like was, that. It yeah. was an abusive parent or something. Anyway, yeah, NYX Wing said love the first few pages had me hooked so they get this letter and when the girls were younger catalina's parents died and she came to live with noemi and her family catalina had previously fallen for a suitor below her station and noemi's father forbid the marriage so her courtship with virgil doyle remained a secret until it was too late to stop it it was all quick they were married real fast noemi's father does not trust virgil whose family used to be wealthy but has since fallen on hard times Virgil has access to Catalina's bank accounts and he worries that she will need specialized care, AKA he thinks she's just being hysterical. The dad, and, and, yeah. Yeah, Noemi's dad and sends yeah. Noemi to check on her for that reason. In exchange for this visit, he says he will let her enroll in a master's anthropology program at university. Says so he will. I don't trust yeah. that dad at all. <laughs> I, and maybe I'm giving the guy too much credit, but I feel a little bit like she kind of has him wrapped around her finger a little That's bit. That's true. Like, I think it's yeah. it's possible. And I do like what you sort of pointed out, um, Hector, in that she does have this freedom and that he sends her. And to me, it feels like he's sort of, even though she can get a little wild, she's still very much trained in all of the right ways to deal mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. knows she's not going to embarrass him. But if he tries to like make a big deal out of it and go get her with you know, a group of dudes or another dude, then it might blow up in their faces. They just don't want to be embarrassed. Yeah. Great comment from M the cartographer, loving how vivid the setting descriptions are. Yeah. It's an interesting contrast with Ashburn, which could be anywhere. We talked about it. Ashburn was like, could be Australian, could be North American, could be in the UK. Canada. Uh, maybe, maybe in the UK version, they say bloody cat. Maybe in the, in the North American version, they don't. And, well, in uh, the, we, we realized that the audiobook still has a lot of the, um, yes. The lingo australian yeah lingo australian and uh and Bernard. m the cartographer says mexican gothic is so specific no preference on either it's just interesting to, mm -hmm. to go from one to the other yeah. so that's the end of chapter one chapter two has oh. noemi heading to the high place the doyle estate located in a small village on the side of a mountain virgil's younger cousin francis picks noemi up from the train station and brings her to the high place the household there is small 
Virgil's father, Howard Doyle, plus Francis and his mother, Florence, live there with Virgil and Catalina. So we kind of are introduced to, and it felt very The Shining as we're going up this winding mountain road. And uh, Francis automatically, I mean, I could not help but think, oh, this is the guy. This guy's good. Mm -hmm. He's a cutie. He's a cutie patootie. And yep. he's going to be a good guy. And they are, they or might he have seems like a cutie patootie. And there's Alarm something bells. else. It's, Alarm bells? It can go either way at this point, in my humble opinion. For he has to know. Twist. And have you noticed as well? I mean, it goes into it, but it's really only the women who are... I, and I want to learn more about the cemetery, but it feels like it's only really affecting the women of the household. The the house itself, the the whatever well, it is. Yeah, the it going will get there later, but yeah. Okay. Interesting. Just Interesting. I just have a thought on that, but I want to wait till we get to that chapter. The thing that got me in this section was that it described how Noemi was talking to him, and it was all very kind of business, and then something happened, and then he smiled you know, he kind of loosened up a little bit, like looking at her in the rear view mirror driving. And so they had a little bit of a, uh, you know, and I, cause I think he was saying like, apologies, we speak English up at the house. And then she went right into speaking English. Like I've had lessons every day since I was six, shouldn't be a problem, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so may, may, I don't know if that was the moment, but I was like, this is very interesting that, um, that the book is also in English and presumably written in English, unless Silvia Moreno Garcia translated this from a Spanish, but I'm pretty sure that she wrote this in English and that the book doesn't do more to signify when characters are speaking Spanish versus English other than this moment where it says she switches to English. I think it leaves the reader, it left me to, to determine, okay, everything up to this point with Noemi was probably in Spanish and that when she's at the house, it's all in English. And I'm yeah. already, I can picture as I'm reading along, because I'm not listening to the audiobook, I can picture the the English with a Mexican accent. But then when she goes later to talk to Catalina privately, I'm like, I think they're speaking Spanish. Like I'm all I'm, my brain is doing the work of trying to decipher when that's mm -hmm. happening and how it can play into the story. I just saw a fantastic quick little interview with Keegan Michael Key of Key and Peel. And he was talking to, this is on YouTube. You can find it if you search Keegan-Michael Key interview. He talks about how his comedy is so rooted, him and um, uh, 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 Jordan Peele. Peele's comedy is rooted in code switching. There's so much yes. code switching that goes into their comedy. And code switching is, you know, Keegan-Michael Key has a, a white mom, I believe, and describes that he would go home and he would talk the way he was talking with his friends earlier at school, you know? And she'd be like, why are you talking like that? Hmm. Like speak properly, speak proper English. Why are you doing that? And he was like, I'm trying to survive over here yeah. and I bring it home with me. And now my mom is like, but you don't have to do that. And he's going, well, it's easier for you to say like, yeah. or yeah. Illinois or whatever, like, and that so much of the comedy in Key and Peele ends up being about how people sometimes have to switch that up to survive or where that comedy can come from. And then he starts to break down the coach sketch where he shows up and it's A.A. Ron yeah. and how, why that's funny. Cause you're like, wait a minute, I, what's happening. And he's, and, and how, my Timothy. And at first you don't know what the hell's happening. And then somebody mm -hmm. raises their hand, like, do you mean Timothy? And the, just the sense oh, okay. of like, I'm from the inner city. I don't take no guff, you know, and you, yeah. you're learning the rules. You're like, okay, this is the rules of, of how this character works. And now he's in a different situation because it's all white kids in this white school, white classroom, less diverse. And then once you understand the rules of that sketch, it becomes so funny because it's just, you know, bouncing back and forth playing tennis. Like once you understand mm -hmm. the rules, uh, Aaron classic. So like code switching is a thing. And just to be thinking about how Noemi, when she's talking to everybody at the house, she's probably speaking English. And then she goes and talks to the doctor. Maybe she's talking to the doctor in Spanish. Like, oh yeah, por favor, me puedes ayudar. Like it's, it's a lot more like, hey, 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 talk to me though. Talk to me. Yeah. I need to get help for my cousin. She goes to the healer. She's probably like, you know, hey, I'm up at the house, but I'm speak. I'm like Mexican, mm -hmm. so can, you know, yeah. can you help me out? So it's very, very interesting. Anyway, after this, at the house, still in chapter two, Noemi insists on seeing Catalina, who is heavily medicated. Catalina apologizes for her letter, telling her, telling her cousin that she has a fever and tuberculosis. But before she can say more, Florence takes her away for her medication, which puts her to sleep. So, so TB is a real thing. I remember my neighbor back in Australia got TB and he was quarantined for three months. <laughs> wow. That's so longer like, than 
most people in the United States try to quarantine themselves for COVID. All right. I'm still quarant. I'm still, I still don't go anywhere and everyone's at bars anyway. Me too. Yeah, it's a real thing. Any other red flags? We're empathetic human beings. Um, mm. Yeah, well, it's also at this point you think- Florence. Have they, have they brainwashed her? And as we go further into it though, it, it feels like, or is she afraid? And, you know, doesn't yeah. want, didn't expect her cousin who she loves, who I believe she's a little bit older and sort of was like a big sister for. Catalina's 10 years older. Yeah, yeah. And so she, it was like, almost like she took care of her a little bit, you know, that kind of, which, um, mm-hmm that age gap I totally get because of my weird yeah. large gap of sibling ages but um it feels like she she was like oh I did not expect them to send her you know she was asking for help that was sort of how I read it it was like oh shit she's here you should go you should go that's why again I think that women are vulnerable in that household oh yeah 100 percent. also yeah. once we get into the eugenics stuff that's a yeah um, and also, were uh, they, um, the fact that she was ushered off to have her medicine, we have to give her her medicine. I'm like, oh, yep, yeah, that's a silencer. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. That did give me sharp objects vibes for sure. Yeah. Or like that that tragic storyline in The Sixth Sense <laughs> with the actress from the yeah. OC. <laughs> Misha Bar- Misha oh, yeah, Barton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Iconic yeah. OC actress, Misha Barton. Also, I will say the the drive up the hill, I know you were saying Overlook Hotel, it also reminded me of Psycho, which I just recently rewatched, which I've seen a million times, but not in a very long time. And the sort of like, I could hear that like Alfred Hitchcock score. Um, <laughs> small bass mm-hmm, and all that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, okay, well, let's get into this next section because we're gonna start right off the bat with the dinner. <laughs> At this dinner. Noemi attempts to ask about the silver mines that the Doyles used to run, but Florence interrupts her, telling her that they do not speak at dinner. Howard Doyle implies that Noemi is somehow inferior because she has indigenous heritage. Great comment from Clever Girl. They made a point of saying that Noemi has more indigenous characteristics. And this was fascinating to me, and I was not thinking about the Gothic um, relationship to that line of thinking. The fact that Sylvia Moreno Garcia wrote a thesis on this with Lovecraft and we just read Lovecraft Country. Now I can make those connections, but I'm going to be flat out honest. When I was reading this section, the thing I was relating to was how my understanding and, and relationship with Mexico and the culture in Mexico is that there is, even though it is Mexican people and it is much less diverse than the United States, and there's a population of black people in Mexico, black Mexicans, but it's much smaller. There is Asians there, much smaller. You know, they, they have immigrants from all over the world, but it's much smaller. But And yet there is still a lot of racism and colorism. Mm-hmm. If you watch Mexican TV, it's a lot of lighter skinned yeah. Spanish, European descended actors and everything. So I have known this my whole life and I felt this my whole life. So to have these characters have a conversation where this guy who is European, but he's he lived in Mexico and has like, they have this whole business there and they've been there. Colonizer essentially. Absolutely. But for him to bring this up to Noemi, who is like, like, like the chat was saying and had the book is saying like she has indigenous features and she's darker skinned or, you know, that's her, that's her, um, her, her ethnicity. Uh, made me immediately go to that and go, yeah, this is the same bullshit yeah. that they were dealing with in 1950. They were dealing with before. They're and she wasn't taking it. Today. She's like, what do you mean by that? Uh, doing it in such a way. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and also doing it in such a way because she is super educated. She's already, I mean, she wants to go to a master's program in anthropology. She is an anthropology student. She is not just a socialite who like, you know, pushes the the limits a little bit. She's super smart and she knows how to deal with men who try to kiss her when she doesn't want to, or men who insult her or don't think that she knows what she's talking about. And not only does she know how to talk to them, but she knows how to do it in such a way that, you know, they don't kick her out or they don't, all of these little things that, um, you know, is, is being, it's basically intersect thinking about intersectionality 
like I can identify with that as a woman, but I can't identify with the uh, racism uh, at all. But it it is this like balancing act that she is doing because she can't just let him do it. And that's why I, I like her so much and why she's still playing the game. It doesn't feel like sometimes in period stories, you're like, okay, well, not everyone was on the side of the civil rights. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. like that mad men does a really good is a good example of being like even the characters you like are like pretty racist or sexist yeah. you know because it's the time <laughs> it's contextual right. um but i like that she she pushes back on him kind of talking about you know eugenics which has a storied history including the holocaust and many other things and mm-hmm. sterilization of popul- populations of women that is still, still happening, happening today in this country. Look it up, donate uh, to places that are helping yeah. women and children at the border. Um, yeah. And it is just mind boggling that this is the first thing he ever talks to her about. Is mm-hmm. like, so you look different from your cousin. Like, your dad it's, a compl- a it's a compliment that, you know, yeah. some part, you know, the way you look yeah. doesn't make you completely inferior. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. Yeah. yeah, and I like that. But then it's almost like because she is like persistent on standing up for herself and not tolerating all of that, they're starting to weaponize her defensiveness, being like, oh, of course you're going to be persistent. You would not lay down and like, you know, adhere to our rules because you're just going to keep being persistent about it. And I was like, and yeah. thus she persisted. Yeah. <laughs> and also I mean, in the books in the library, there's this sort of like, well, they're really be- like the women are very beautiful, but they're just not raised in in polite society. And you can feel them trying to fit her into some sort of box that's like she's agitated, she's fiery, or other, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Listen, this book is not from 1950. Moreno Garcia wrote this, and it yep, was published this, this year. year. I'm positive, yeah. everything we're talking about is finding its way into this story. Oh, it's super intentional. It's super, yeah. super intentional. Yeah. Great oh my comments gosh. in the in the chat. Yeah. Tamaranian says Sylvia Moreno Garcia's thesis is a PDF on her blog. If anyone wants to read it, I do. I, I don't know if we can. If there's any way that Nerdist can find that and drop that link in the chat, I don't know if we can do that. That would be awesome. Game Wizard also says I imagined Christopher Plummer as the old man, which oh, is really good casting. Really, that good is so good because it's oh, like God. the opposite of his character in Knives Out. It's like the. It's like whoa, <laughs> that's he was so nice in that. Well, also Captain Von Trapp like loosens up, but he's, he, I mean, he's mm-hmm. very young and handsome in that, but um, mm-hmm. he he gives that stern vibe so well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the cartographer, is gaslighting a trope in Gothic literature? I mean, I've only yes. read Jane Eyre and Wuthering I'm pretty Heights. sure, yes. <laughs> and those made me want to throw the books off a cliff. <laughs> Well, like Rachel was talking about this, this dinner conversation is, is, is honestly great to read because Noemi is used to speaking with dumb men. She's, and also a student of anthropology, which is so crazy that being a student of anthropology is basically going to be a defense against racism, which is really interesting. She's still very understandably offended by this topic. Uh, it, it's, it's basically eugenics, AKA selective breeding, sterilization, genocide of cultures deemed to be inferior often perpetrating, perpetrated by white supremacists and colonizers. And like Rachel was saying, I could just picture her eating and just being like, well, you know, I read a study that uh, <laughs> certain traits from uh, indigenous people make them like stronger and that they're like better. What do you think about that? <laughs> like I just, you know, with the way she was able to use some knowledge that she had yeah. and still sort of keep her cool, but still be really pissed, I think was fantastic. After yeah. dinner, she meets with Virgil. She's holding her own with this weird family, lets him know that she's just there to make sure her cousin is okay. Virgil lets her know that Catalina is being seen by an actual doctor, Dr. Arthur Cummins, but Florence administers the medication. He's also annoyed that Noemi's father like, suggested hiring a psychiatrist. Virgil is annoyed by that. P.S. Catalina loves gothic horror and fantasy, while Noemi would rather go to a party in a convertible. Both relatable. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm probably more like, I'm going to be real. I'm probably more like Noemi. The way she describes having a convertible, I'm like, all right, I'll give that a shot. But I'm enjoying this gothic horror. So maybe I'm more like Catalina. I don't know. Uh, we can, we can take multitudes. Yeah. I think 
no brainer it is <laughs> no emmy and that is oh you're going to try to make me feel inferior look inferior sound inferior but apply rules to me that should really not be applied restrict who i am and my uh well like you know my access and yeah 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 this suppression that's happening i don't have time for it i don't like it i'm not going to adhere to it and i'm going to break all of your rules yep so yeah, yeah. no i mean it is me uh yeah i i also like that she plays within the system a little bit to her benefit and you can tell that she's like sort of trying to placate and calm down these men while not giving up her own independence and using her sort of not like i I feel like i um when we first started this book club and we read haunting of hill house we had a very funny split of the characters we identified with um and Hector and I were very into um the sort of shy one and Maude was into the Noemi style one but I do think that like uh you know it's been four years it we we started it in October of 2016 so just think about that um and (laughs) and, but I do feel like I have evolved to be a like like split where because I grew up with a lawyer dad who argued like a cool he's a cool lawyer but just you had to kind of know every possible argument to make in order to get him to do or agree to anything and think about possible loopholes and I feel like I've only recently started using that skill but just that like Mm. calm here is the knowledge Mm. like I'm not blowing everything up but I am making you feel like I'm blowing everything up exactly exactly flipping your gaslighting on yourself where it's like what what do you mean I'm being super calm I don't know what you're talking I'm playing by the rules yeah we've all evolved over the past four years I mean (laughs) Maude has has went from a Gryffindor to a Slytherin so you know we've all evolved next chapter chapter four Noemi wakes up. The, oh no! Oh, she's gone. Maude quit the show. Oh no! We had Noemi a good wakes, four years, y'all. Noemi wakes up the next morning to breakfast and tea. These notes are from Rachel, and she must have written this when she was hungry. That smells vaguely no. fruity. Hmm. No, wait, no, you weren't. Hungry. I will explain why I wrote that if you want. I was just breakfast, breakfast and tea, and you're suspect the tea, of the. She says that the tea. She doesn't like tea, and it smells fruity. Yes, mm. and the wine. She had then, one glass of wine and was immediately sweet. like drunk. Or, or like, mm. so I'm thinking the medication ain't what it seems. The, yeah. the red wine. And there's all these shrooms sedative. appearing everywhere, and and the staff are like cleaning off a bunch of mushrooms and stuff. And we get into that. So mm. yes, it has been a week, so I did not provide enough context. But there, That's it okay. wasn't just because I was hungry. Uh, well, so I'm hungry right like now. That's why I thought that. Um, the library is filled with old rotting books and magazines about eugenics. One such journal contains theories about the quote half breed mezzo mezzo of uh, uh, mezzo of Mexico and their positive genetic attributes, aka their women's bodies. Gross. Noemi meets their three staff members, Lizzie, Charles, and Mary, but none of them speak to her. The high place has no power, it is cold and quiet. She bumps into Francis, who is a bit friendlier than the others in the house. He takes her to explore an abandoned graveyard, which only adds to the creepiness of the high of the what high. What a place. death and plague! He, yeah. yeah, and that was also. Let me tell you, man. From now on, for the rest of my life, any anytime I read any fiction that's that's like there was a pandemic, I'll be like, yeah, I lived through that. Like I, I feel like I get it. <laughs> what else now. you got? I know. Yeah, I'm like, like I'm I get scared. it more. I get it now more. You're like, oh, oh sure. Yeah, Great. yeah. And, I'm like, and yeah. the people in power mistreated yeah, yeah, those yeah, they yeah. deemed uh, yeah, less yeah. than after yep, they yep, died. Yep. yep. Tell me what that's like. Yep, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so so uh, Francis explains to the uh, some of the Doyle family history first that his great uncle revived a nearby silver mine after Mexico's independence from Spain and employed is- English miners to run the machinery. There was an epidemic in 1888, which killed most of the English miners who were buried in the graveyard, but not the Mexican ones. They dumped those bodies in a pit. Down the road. Which, which yeah. Is, yeah, which is uh, coming up. But I just have a question. When yeah. I read this, I sort of thought it was an ancestor when he said my great uncle and that they both have the name Howard, but it's actually Howard, right? It's it's old man in, in the house, right? Oh, uh, probably. Because we're 1950, that's 1888. Yeah, he's old enough, it checks out. 
So he's no, just wait. like super, super old. Yeah, he is supposed to be old. That yeah, because he is supposed to be older, and Virgil is 70. 35. So, How would, that... so Virgil was born in the 20s. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's Howard Sr. Maybe there's a dad who started the Maybe. Howard stuff. And then, because, I mean, unless this dude. Because what we over... learn about Ruth later is when um, Virgil was a baby, which means it was around the 1920s. So I think it's probably Howard Sr. And the one we know is Howard Jr. Someone I, tell me if you're. I flipped to the back, and Sylvia Mordano Garcia did not put a family tree. I love illustrations in the back of a book. None yeah. here. But there is something kind of cool. There's something about the type, which is kind of cool. Look at Ooh, that. Ooh, I love typography. Look at that. This book was set in Sabon, a typeface designed by the well-known German typographer Jan Tichkoid Cold. Uh, Sabon's design is based upon the original letter forms of 16th century French type designer Claude Garamond and was created specifically oh, to be used for three sources, foundry type for hand composition, linotype, and monotype. Tichkoid named his typeface for the famous Frankfurt type founder Jacques Sabon. Look, people that are into typefaces, they just heard me go. I was just going to say, gonna that. say she, that is like ultimate nerd and I love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> and she gave yeah. a playlist. What a legend. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay, let's finish up chapter four real quick. He also reveals that the revolution in the mine flooding is what closed down the silver mines and the Doyle family's fortune for good. Chapter five, Noemi is able to see Catalina alone and her cousin asks her to get medicine from a woman in town named Marta Duval. She warns Noemi that they're listening and that there are ghosts in the walls speaking to her. Je just then, the doctor arrives and Noemi is kicked out of Catalina's room. She then is able to speak to Dr. Kemen, who tells her that Catalina is fine, but she just needs rest and relaxation. Noemi insists that something is wrong, that Catalina is so different from the cousin she knows. The doctor claims that Catalina has always been anxious and melancholic and that Noemi is agitated. Gaslighting. <sighs> no, my gut instinct says, I've seen what the effects of tuberculosis are. I know who my cousin is. This is strange behavior. Ooh, yeah. can you calm no, you're down? Cra you're crazy oh, and boy. she's crazy. And could you calm down because I'm just being normal. Who's her mother? I'm, yeah. I'm yeah, like, when she was a kid yeah it's much yeah. like the past four years the gaslighting in this book is trigger it's just like that is that's a nightmare a level trope. of between yeah. anyone on the after show will know some of my <laughs> history like anytime there's that where they're and I just love that she she's like what I would like to have been in situations where I've been gaslight where you're like nope mm -hmm. which is hard I know what I'm talking about you don't know me you don't know my cousin Oh, Miss Neckermans made such a great analogy. She was like, this doctor is still too real for women of color. Doctors are to brown women what cops are to brown men. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You don't exist as a full person. Yeah. I tell you exactly what you're feeling, who you are and why you're wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there, there are so many more, um, you know, uh, illnesses and severe situations for black women, women of color mm -hmm. that are ignored by doctors so much so that there's just a whole like mess of psycho like psychological profiles and books about this and about how they are not taken. So seriously. yeah, they complain and it's like, you're fine. You're overreacting and they die. And then they yep. die. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's fucked up. It, yeah. So it very, very interesting that Silvia Moran Garcia <laughs> is pulling some of that and putting it into this story. So right then at that moment, Virgil chimes in and Noemi wonders how on earth this cold creature courted Catalina. Yes, Rachel is very proud of this alliteration. It's been a long week. Oh, good. Yeah, I really liked that. I liked that a lot. <laughs> I wrote it and I was oh, like, Richard, there's like, five, it's, how many is it? Yeah. Colt sending Catalina to a psychiatrist, challenging both Virgil and the doctor. That night, Noemi dreamed that a golden flower and an array of golden mushrooms grew out of the wallpaper. And when she reaches out to touch them, they turn to golden dust that surrounds her. She senses a presence in the room and sees a woman in a golden dress glowing like a firefly. The figure tries to speak, but nothing comes out because she doesn't, because doesn't she doesn't even a have a mouth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, Rachel is asking, did this scene remind anyone of Annihilation? Immediately. Yeah. Growing yeah. out of the wallpaper, cut to Natalie Portman and the wall. <laughs> well, and in the book, we read uh, the first book. I read the whole trilogy and quite, like some of it and not other parts but even the the 
also the movie and the book are very different but the mm-hmm. the in the book when she gets into the lighthouse and is going down these it she's yep. touching the wall and sort of getting infected with whatever is happening Bores. Mm-hmm. yeah Bores okay. exactly chapter six the last chapter that we read and then afterwards mod is going to tell us what happens in chapter seven chapter six no nope. no nope. Noemi asks Francis to borrow his car and then she drives to a local doctor's office to ask for a second opinion about Catalina. He tells her more about the mysterious epidemic that killed workers up at the mine, characterized by fever and hallucinations, and that the Doyles dumped the non-English bodies in a pit. Ancient burial ground? Question mark? Maybe curse, maybe curse, yeah. 100% Also just deeply, deeply dehumanizing and fucked up. Yes, yes. And I unfortunately went to the images of it was happening in New York City when when there were first people dying and oh, hospitals God, were overflowing. Yeah. Those things we saw in the news with yeah. the big pits being buried and it's crazy. The doctor does not want to offend the Doyles or Dr. Cummins by coming to see Carolina, but Noemi convinces him to come to the high place. Noemi I, I really liked how it was like a money exchange thing. It was like, I can't do that because this is how the money trickles down. Correct. Mm-hmm. And I can't Correct. disrupt that flow. Yeah. Yeah. She goes to see Marta Duval the local healer that Catalina sent her to meet. Marta tells Noemi that she believes the Doyle family is cursed. Howard's yeah. daughter, uh, Ruth, was to marry her cousin, Michael, but a week before the wedding, she shot her groom, her mother, her father, her uncle, and her aunt. She may have even killed her baby brother, Virgil, but Florence hid him away, or only her father survived. After that tragedy, the family got rid of most of their servants and stayed hidden away at the high place. Then suddenly, Florence left the town and returned with a husband, Richard. He was different than the Doyles, friendly and talkative with the locals. So talkative that he began to tell stories of ghosts and spirits as he began wasting away before their eyes. He stopped coming to town and eventually then his body was found at the bottom of a ravine. He, he left should behind have been talking, son, should he? Francis, he should not have been talking. Oops. In this whole thing, well, I'll talk about it in a second. Nomi doesn't believe the story is a curse, but a sad coincidence. Marta tells her that everything the Doyles touch rots and it will take Marta a week to make the medicine Catalina requested. So Noemi promises to come back in a week. And this whole time too, this woman is very like, uh, she's My like- My story about- costs money. Yep, the person, yep. Uh, the medicine yep. costs money. And I'm going to tell the like, story in yeah. parts as well. And each installation of the story is a down payment as well. By the way, I will take the cigarettes, not for me, but because the spirit loves to chuff. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I loved her. And I, uh, that was sort of what this part was what I was thinking of Maude when you were worried about the women, because I agree with you, but I also think it's non Doyles because they're clearly into eugenics. They're clearly into, um, I mean, trying to get Ruth to marry her cousin. There's all of this sort of weirdness around, uh, again, eugenics, which is super, super, messed up and the fact that Florence goes away brings someone from the outside presumably that her family doesn't really have any say in and then he ends up at the bottom of a ravine after yeah, it sounds like he was just talking the the fact that um this other Ruth is having is like obviously the extreme version of what Catalina is about to go towards mm-hmm. and that is loss of sense uh you know trying to end whatever kind of like punishment they are being put through in an internal fashion possession whatever it is but Mm -hmm. but but richard is this is he starts out being super chill he's a strong dude he's hanging out with the locals and then he starts to hallucinate he starts to say really weird things and i think it's something about you know preserving this weird bloodline of some sort Mm -hmm. and also i'm calling it now i think florence is a good guy disguised as a bad guy florence is a good guy disguised i could be i could be extremely wrong but i think she might be not a good guy but it's almost an Mm anti-hero or side character that is like trying to help oh she's extremely unlikable but i do think that she might be trying to smooth things over or keep mm-hmm. people safe while still going along with some really bad things that's just my instinct from listen the temerary a great question we're talking about florence Francis what, could go what either about way. the machine I... what about the machine we're talking about florence, <laughs> but what about the machine the dog days are over the dog days are over okay um 
these are great. Again, I feel like for the past couple of books, I have just been so not in a place where I'm trying to guess ahead. I really am like letting this story roll over me. I haven't been overthinking about theories about what's going on in the high place, but I'm definitely- That's just how my vibes. brain works. Yeah, I know, of course, of course, yeah, of course. Same, same. I start Absolutely. compiling clues. Uh, and the cartographer earlier said like, because we're trying to figure out is uh, Francis good, bad? And there's a couple of like throwaway lines there where like he's holding her and he's got a really strong grasp. Mm. That's what Michelle picks up on. There's mm. other he's things. He's a little jealous of his mm. cousin and him being sort of the the chosen one of this family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Also, Weirwood I do says... think in thrillers and gothic stories, that sort of misdirection of someone who seems bad might be yes. good and someone who seems... Like, so I, anything I read that's even potentially like that, I'm like, well, maybe. No, well, maybe. Weirwood yeah, says, Francis funny. reminds me of the groom in Ready or Not. And I Weirwood also says, to sort of sum everything up, and I agree with Weirwood, toss High Place out the airlock because this whole establishment is suspect, okay? <laughs> so here, here I, haven't, is, I haven't played that game, but I honestly thought, when I read that comment earlier that it was um, battle scripts and I'm a little sad, but it's just because <laughs> I'm not hip to the, to the game. Yeah, well, here, I knew that as soon as AOC played it, I was like, I'm not cool enough to play this game. I'll never play it. All right, uh, <laughs> your homework for next week yes. is to read chapters seven through 12. And we're also, this is very exciting, opening a new poll for our next book. We're going to announce the winner at the end of next week's show. We want to give people advanced time to get copies of books and support their local bookstores. You put kind of glass can. in there? What's that? I've just, I'm on the last book of the series. I've just listened to it. Oh, I was going to suggest it. Name of the Wind. I was going to suggest Name of the Wind. Maude, what are our options for the, for the Twitter poll? What are oh, our I choices? Sorry. <laughs> We got The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein, Vicious, which uh, a lot of people on Twitter are like, yay, finally Vicious getting the recognition it deserves. Cool. Uh, the Parable of the Sower, which I believe was a previous uh, option a few Yeah, those ago. past three were in our last one because mm -hmm. it was so close for a while. People were really excited about all three of those. And I think it's time that we do some Octavia Butler because she's amazing. Mm -hmm. But I picked Throne of Glass because people... Boom. You've re record your recommended it a million times. And I've listened to it twice, of... but now that I'm on my second run through to talk about it in a book club, maybe it's Okay, just... so no one vote for that. <laughs> Lee, Unless... do we have the poll up yet? Do you want to put me? This, this is for November, I think. No, we're in November. Yes, Name this is for November. I know we're trying to get, because I, I do like the fact that it's a female author. You know what? The first Throne of Glass book is actually pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Should we put like oh, should we put like a holiday book on there instead? <laughs> no, no, no. We'll do it for, December. for December. Okay, oh, okay. Holidays well, those... are only allowed in rom coms, especially all of the ones coming out this year that have queer people, folks of color, That's Hallmark, it. ghosts, That's it. ghosts, ghosts. Christmas ghost husbands. I've started something saying name of the wind. I'm sorry. The 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 are people mad now that they the, want because they want the, to pick that one. The Why don't we do that up, for everybody. next month? We can. We can do it for next next month. Why don't we do that for January? Let's the right Miss Necromancer. To be fair, I only said holiday book. I ain't said nothing about Christmas. That's everybody uh, assuming. So that's all I'm saying. That's fair. Are there? I mean, I'm sure there are. <laughs> Front of Glass is a pretty easy read, actually. It is a small. Because uh, it is. Oh. I mean, Name of the Wind's chunky. It's long. It's Name of the Wind's a chunkier book. So Ooh, why don't we do that for it. January? Go vote for whatever you want, but please yeah. vote for The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein, please. please. And I do really want to read that. You can check I out want to read all episodes. of them. That's why I put them. Yeah. That's We've bad. got previous episodes of Nerdist Book Club on Nerdist YouTube or Geek and Sundries Twitch. Make sure that you like and subscribe. And Maude, please tell us where we're going after this. The after show, the official after show for Nerdist Book Club is Geek Bomb After Show. And to get access to that, head over to Geek Bomb's Discord. It is a paid uh, perk. So if you sign up to patreon.com slash geekbomb, whatever tier you sign up for, you'll get access to that. We uh, will be in the book club call. So it's a chat. It's a Q&A. If you get shy, don't even worry about it. Like we just- We can rant plenty if no one- <laughs> Thank you guys Nada, so much for watching. Oh yeah, I can. Read chapter 7 through 12 of Mexican Gothic. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Stay patient about the pulse and everything. Bye. The call is coming.